thank you very much indeed. Um, Aristotle, no less a person, tells us that uh, when we're about to address an audience, we should give them some reason to believe that uh, we know what we're talking about. So uh, I'd just like to preface my remarks by saying that they are predicated on, on two things. Uh, one is I recently wrote a book uh, called Democracy and Its Crisis, which was um, prompted by the election of Donald Trump in America and by the Brexit referendum here in 2016. And I'm now writing a sequel to it called The Good State, which is on political and constitutional reform. And indeed, that uh, uh, feeds into the topic of my talk this afternoon. And the, the second thing is that I have the very, very interesting privilege of uh, chairing the coordinating group of all the national Remainer organisations in the UK. Uh, so this shows you that I'm not entirely neutral on the question of Brexit, which may emerge uh, during the course of my remarks. And so uh, ha ha having given you some reason uh, to believe that I, I, I've given some thought to what I'm just about to tell you, I'm going to launch into my account. And given that we have a relatively short amount of time for a very big subject, um, I'm going to do it in the following way. I'd like to remind you of um, something uh, that happened in uh, 2016 in the uh, referendum process that we had in that year. Um, if you go back in indeed to, to the discussion in the House of Commons on the referendum bill for that referendum, and the um, discussions, as you know, took place in June 2015, if you go back to the publication of the House of Commons briefing paper number 07212, should you wish to look it up on, on the internet, which was published on the 3rd of June 2015, uh, in preparation for that debate in the House. Uh, so I just uh, mentioned to you that um, the House of Commons very helpfully produces these briefing papers for MPs in relatively short sentences, and simple words and so on, so that MPs can understand what the bill is that they might uh, hear about in the House of Commons, since very few of them actually read all the detail. And if you look at that briefing paper, you will see in section five of it that it points out that uh, on constitutional grounds, referendums are only and can only be advisory. This is because of the sovereignty of parliament. Now, in the discussion section, we may uh, go to the question of the sovereignty of the UK Parliament, which has uh, um, been uh, affected uh, somewhat by membership of the EU and also by devolution of powers to uh, Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, but the, the, the short conclusion of a discussion about sovereignty is that the, uh, the Parliament of the United Kingdom retains absolute sovereignty uh, as we um, see from the current uh, situation at the moment of the Parliament uh, seeking to take back powers that it had uh, shared or sequestered in the interests of a, of a larger project. So because uh, Parliament is sovereign, it, it cannot um, yield to any other body or process uh, an, an overruling or trumping power. So uh, referendums can only be advisory. So this is pointed out in section five of that briefing paper. And section six adds the thought, not in exactly these terms, but in a uh, more circumstantial fashion, that if there was any suggestion that a referendum would be regarded as uh, binding in its outcome in any way, then it would be wise to have either a supermajority requirement or a threshold requirement. Um, and presumably the authors of the briefing paper had included that section because a political commitment had been made by the then Prime Minister, David Cameron, to the effect <coughs> that whatever the outcome of the referendum, it would be honoured by, by his government. So uh, in the House of Commons, uh, later in that month, I think it was on 16th of June 2015, the then Minister for <coughs> Europe, uh, Mr Liddington, <coughs> said in answer to a question on the floor of the House that the uh, referendum was uh, only advisory and that was why there was no provision in the bill for the referendum for a threshold or a supermajority. So I just want to put those, those uh, um, uh, two points uh, up on, the, uh, on the, the desktop of the screen of your mind, so to speak, so you can remember it, because they are crucial to an understanding of uh, a claim I'm about to make, which is that the referendum of 2016 and a few months later the uh, election of Donald Trump in the United States of America are symptoms of a of a failure in our democratic order. And to explain that a, a little bit more uh, fully, in 2014, 
the um, Scottish independence referendum, you may remember, had a, uh, an electorate enfranchised for the referendum, which included people of age 16 and uh, up uh, on the grounds that their future was going to be very considerably affected by the outcome of that referendum. And it also included citizens of other EU countries who live, work, pay their taxes, are married to Scots people, have Scottish children and so on in uh, Scotland because their futures too would be considerably affected by the outcome of, a, of that referendum. Now the um, uh, idea that a, a referendum uh, electorate uh, ought to be one that gives a voice to all those who will be materially affected by the outcome of the referendum <coughs> is a, a, a principle which seems to have a, a good deal in its favour. The electorate enfranchised for the 2016 referendum, a EU referendum, was a general election electorate, despite the fact that there had been considerable discussion beforehand as to whether the electorate ought to be uh, enriched uh, to take account of the fact that there were other constituencies of people whose interests would be very uh, um, greatly affected by the outcome, including uh, expats, uh, British expats who've been living abroad for 15 years or more and who have been promised repeatedly that they would be re-included in the franchise for general elections and referendums in this country, having for some reason been excluded um, earlier. And also there was the question, it was debated, it was discussed, uh, uh, that 16-year-olds on the same grounds uh, as had been appealed to in the case of the Scottish independence referendum should be included in the EU referendum. And it was decided to exclude them because the um, uh, group, interested group on the right of the Conservative Party felt that to admit them would be to incorporate a, a natural uh, remain element that would be distorting of the outcome. So <coughs> the, um, the electorate for that referendum was a straightforward standard general election uh, electorate. What was the outcome of that referendum? Well, the outcome was that 37% of those enfranchised voted to leave. 37% of the total electorate voted to leave. On the day, uh, the vote was 51.9% uh, in favour of leave. But the fact that the proportion of the electorate was 37% is one that raises very serious and interesting questions. After all, it is the law in this country that a trades union uh, can only have a strike if it has balloted all its members and 40% or more of its members agree to the strike or, or um, support the idea of a strike. So a threshold requirement is built into trades union legislation for the very good reason that we need to protect ourselves against minoritarian influence. That is, if just a small group of activists in the trades union were militantly in favour of having a strike and, and one was held, then of course it would be against the interests of many of the members whose livelihoods would be affected, against the interests of the company uh, affected by the strike and so on. And so the idea of a, of a threshold as a protection against uh, minoritarian over-influence is a very important one. But that wasn't, despite, despite the uh, points made in the briefing paper uh, um, put out by the House of Commons, that point wasn't taken on board. The 2011 Parliament Act, which gives us fixed term parliaments now, uh, says that if there is to be a general election outside the, the period of the, um, of the Parliament, there has to be a 66% um, approval of uh, a dissolution and a new general election of all sitting members of the House of Commons. 66%. And the reason for that very high bar, very high supermajority requirement is that a general election can change the future course of the country because the sitting government might be ousted, a new government come in and a new set of policies instituted. And therefore to protect the sitting government um, <coughs> against, uh, and to protect the country against an arbitrary uh, change of direction, a uh, very high bar is uh, put in place. So I'm going to leave that on the desktop of the screens of your mind as well. The fact that trades union legislation and um, uh, um, legislation affecting the activities of Parliament have in place either thresholds or supermajority requirements on grounds that you might think uh, apply to a referendum of such a consequential nature as the EU referendum. So I could leave those in place. Now why is it that um, uh, the uh, 
arrangements made for the 26 ref uh, 2016 referendum didn't include these considerations? Why weren't they taken seriously? Well, this alerts us to something of interest, which is that every referendum that we've had in this country since 1975 has been held on a slightly different basis. There is no clarity and consistency. There is no fixed order uh, for referendums and understandings of their outcome. Each one is, as it were, made up as we go along. And that is a very serious and worrying point. Firstly, of course, in a representative democracy such as we have here, where the adjective representative does a very great deal of work, referendums are not native. They are, in fact, rather contradictory to representative democracies, as you know. The whole point of a representative democracy is that uh, the, um, th those enfranchised in the society with a vote will send to the legislature um, people who have a job of work to do on behalf of those who send them there. And the job of work in question is to get information, to uh, listen to um, uh, advice and argument, to discuss, to form a judgment, and to act in the best interests of the country and of constituents overall. The idea of representation uh, is the idea that uh, with the complexities of uh, public policy matters and of government of a country and sometimes serious decisions that affect many hundreds of thousands or millions of people, the process of uh, deciding, debating and deciding, must be one which is conducted in a very responsible manner. Uh, if you have a very small society, if you go back to Rousseau's idea of the ideal democracy, which is a group of men um, standing underneath a tree in a Swiss canton somewhere, uh, coming to decision about how the village is going to be run, then, uh, as he, Rousseau himself, points out, that is the ideal. But as he, Rousseau himself, also points out, it doesn't scale. And so if you have a large and uh, populous and numerous um, uh, country, um, the representative system has a great deal to recommend it for the reasons that I've just outlined. So referendums are not native to representative democracies. And the question of the constitutional uh, effect of the, a referendum's outcome and it's the relationship of that effect to the, the duties, the responsibilities of the legislature and the executive in the constitution becomes a very tricky one. But the fact that, um, uh, that referendums uh, can be held is a, an indication of uh, one kind of problem um, that uh, uh, needs to be discussed, because there are two. There are problems about the people and the personnel and the practices of a political and constitutional order, and there are questions about the institutions of uh, a, a constitutional order. And um, I want to argue that in our Westminster model democracies, there are problems with both those things. The fact that we hold referendums at all is a symptom of failure in the political and constitutional order. The fact that the referendums uh, have been held on different bases, uh, one after the other, instead of there being the clarity and consistency I mentioned, is another symptom. Uh, and also the fact that the um, institutions themselves no longer seem to protect the people of a country or, or, or the, um, uh, the overall uh, policy um, fr framework meant to be operative in the interests of, of the country uh, is a, uh, an indication or a symptom of a problem with the institutions also. Uh, as an example of that, uh, let me remind you that in the United States of America, uh, presidents are elected by an electoral college. The electoral college is uh, based on non-proportionally on uh, a state's basis, not on a, uh, an overall population basis. In November of 2016, Hillary Clinton received more than three million votes, uh, more than Donald Trump did in the popular vote, but he received uh, the right votes in the right places for the Electoral College vote uh, and therefore was elected president. I just remind you, and this is the more significant point, uh, that the Electoral College was instituted by the founders of the United States to ensure that uh, ignorant, childish, narcissistic, self-centered, boorish <coughs> sex harassers wouldn't get into the White House. So obviously, it's working very well. So the, the, uh, the, that, that, that fact itself would be a, a reason for thinking that the functioning of the institutions leave something to be desired and that we need to dig into it. And my argument is that when we do dig into it, we find that there are even greater problems. So let me take a step back now and say why I use the expression Westminster model. Well, as you know, um, we uh, in these uh, 
um, Blessed Islands have uh, for a, a long time, until fairly recently anyway, regarded with a great deal of self-satisfaction our parliamentary system which you've exported to well over 50 countries uh, around the world as a result of our imperial activities in the last couple of centuries. Uh, and um, w one of those Westminster model countries is actually the United States of America. You may be surprised uh, to know that, but let me very quickly remind you that uh, um, the uh, founding fathers of the United States looked to, uh, to England, obviously had uh, uh, the experience of being uh, under English or British rule, um, for all its history until the revolution, and in particular to the writings of uh, John Locke and of Montesquieu. Now Montesquieu was a great admirer himself of what he thought was the constitutional settlement of 1688 in this country. And it was he who gave the idea to the Americans that there should be four uh, um, balancing um, uh, organs of, uh, of the constitution. So there should be a, a legislature, uh, there should be a, 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 an executive. Um, the legislature sh should have two uh, arms so that there can be um, some balancing and second thoughts available there, so a House of Representatives and a, and a Senate. And there should be a judiciary which is uh, itself independent and which has a, a, an input into whether the behaviour of the state is in conformity with its own constitution. So the idea of a, of a House of Representatives, a Senate, a Presidency, and a Supreme Court, an independent judiciary, was the model. And it was based on the model of King, Lords, Commons, and uh, Judiciary in England. So these were meant to be um, separate. And both Locke and Montesquieu insisted on the tremendous importance of the separation of powers between the, these four um, branches. So the executive, the crown in, in England and the presidency in, in America, was to be independent of the legislature. In the United States of America, that independence persists. No member of the, of the legislature, either of the House of Representatives or the Senate, can be a minister, can be uh, uh, um, in the government. The president appoints his cabinet and his, uh, uh, his ministry from outside. And then the um, judiciary is meant to be independent of both legislature and executive. Well, in this country, um, uh, all the fault really of George I not uh, speaking English, the um, separation of powers between executive and legislature collapsed. And the executive is drawn from the majority in the legislature in, in the uh, English parliament and in all those parliaments modelled on it, other than the American one. And the result is that the legislature is the creature of the executive and not an independent body that holds the executive to account uh, and uh, um, uh, monitors its activity and restrains its activity. And that is a very, very serious fault with the system, that collapse in the separation of powers. In the United States of America, the collapse in the separation of powers uh, operates between the political process overall and the judiciary. I have only to mention the word Kavanaugh, and you will see that the appointments of the Supreme Court are highly political. You may not know this, but in the last two years of the last Obama presidency, second Obama presidency, the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee, which is controlled by the Republican Party, uh, blocked uh, appointments that Obama was attempting to make to, the, uh, appeal, to appeal court seats in the different appeal districts of the United States. And that since the Trump election, the um, Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, uh, under the influence of Mitch McConnell, has been filling those appeal court uh, um, uh, judges' seats with young Republican judges who will be there for a very long time and therefore will have a great influence on the, on the character of the social fabric of the United States, as indeed will the fact that the Supreme Court now has a, an, an asymmetry in the left-right balance on it. The fact that these are, are in, in effect political appointments and that therefore the separation of powers has failed in that direction is in itself very significant. So in both cases, both in the, the UK style version of the, of the model, which by the way is replicated in Canada and Australia and India, uh, as I said, over 50 countries, mainly of the, uh, of the original empire of the Commonwealth, and in America, we see that the fundamental conception um, of, of the kind of constitution which eventually evolved into a representative constitution uh, has in it embedded in its foundations some difficulties which need to be addressed.
in our own case in, in the UK, if the, if the institutions, that is to say the um, uh, parliament and executive, uh, if, if the separation of powers that existed there, that were meant to exist there, did indeed exist, then the um, question of how public policy is uh, executed would be very different. And it raises the, the, the question whether or not it would even have been conceivable that there should be a, a referendum on EU membership. Given the fact that the question about uh, um, EU membership is one which is so complex and which requires such detailed uh, thought about the consequences of one direction of um, travel as against the another, that it really does need very careful and uh, well-informed um, uh, discussion. You will remember that um, the campaign in favour of leaving the EU, uh, the fact the nature of the campaign itself raises a certain number of questions about illegalities and claims that uh, were unfulfillable and so on, but leaving those aside, uh, if you were to ask what was the programme that was offered to people other than merely leaving the EU, uh, then we see there wasn't one. No plans, no programme, no roadmap, no um, assessments of impacts, no costings, um, nothing whatever, just a, a yes-no, in-out uh, kind of question. And the other problem with, with that, and the reason why a representative system is and, and should be so much more uh, effective than using or appealing to referendums, is the following. This is something else which, which is, as it were, taken the skin off, off the problems with our, um, our system. And that is the advent of social media as a platform for doing what has already been done, of course, in the way of propaganda and argument and uh, information and disinformation, and that's always been part of, of the political process, but it has weaponized it. Uh, you will know uh, very probably much better than I, but i tell you the following anecdote that a friend of mine came over last year from New York and he said to me, uh, you know, he said, um, I put into my Google Calendar an appointment I was going to have at a clinic in Manhattan and for th the next three days I was bombarded with advertisements from my local crematorium. And <laughs> just it seems very comical until you think about it a little bit that Google, or, or its algorithms at least, know what the clinic deals with and they know what the specialist of the clinic deals with and they know um, whether or not he's been there before and they know how old he is and they put it all together and decided he should clock into his local crematorium which is a bit chilling when you think about it uh, and it's an indication of something that we also all know but perhaps don't reflect on enough which is that um, these uh, uh, systems that we make such very good use of Facebook and Twitter and WhatsApp and, and so on, um, collect data about us individually and collate them and analyze them. They know more about us than we know about ourselves. It's a, almost a dead certainty. If I said to you, what were you doing at you know, about four o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon five years ago in, in February, you would be pretty hard put to remember, but I'm pretty damn sure that Google or, or Yahoo or somebody will know. So this, this uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, agglomeration of information about individuals, which um, w when you think about the tremendous power and utility of uh, big data uh, work, big data analytics, a fantastic tool for epidemiology and for scientific research and so on, it's a marvelous tool, but it's also used um, by uh, um, organizations for other and further purposes. Uh, the, the data is sold on by Facebook and these, these other service providers. And you will get perhaps a, a company, as it might be Cambridge Analytica, would never dream of an Oxford Analytica doing this, but Cambridge Analytica will have a look at this data and it will be able to, to um, start identifying groups of people. So it will see that you, you like guns, <laughs> you want more of them. So does that lady there and this gentleman at the back. So it can make a little group of you, it can test messaging to you and it can micro-target messaging. And I promise you, you can have as many guns as you like. Now I know you don't like taxation. Now this is the lady behind you and the, another gentleman at the back. So I can micro-target messaging to you about taxation and so on and so on, immigration, all sorts of other things. And in this way, I can aggregate micro-targeted groups of people into a single block. The micro-targeted groups may not know of one another at all or care about one another or be interested in one another, but I've got them, I've aggregated them into uh, support for me. And the importance of this is as follows. In almost every election or referendum, you've got your 
Clinton, Trump, uh, in, out, you know, up and down, blocks. People have usually made up their minds how they're going to vote, and they may, for that reason, tune out of the campaigns, because the campaign's are just boring. They've already decided. But in between them, there is a group of people who haven't made up their minds, or who could be persuaded differently, or who could be influenced. And if you can get just enough of them to shift in one direction or the other, you can win. And this is because elections and referendums are typically won on extremely small margins. And so if you can identify the right people, and if you can test and hone and micro-target messaging to them uh, in a way that uh, social media now makes far more effective than has ever been the case before with newspaper advertisements and billboards and television um, party political broadcasts and so on. If you can do it now with this powerful new weapon, you can have a major effect. And indeed, uh, we've seen from uh, what we know about uh, what happened in the 2016 referendum that this was extremely successfully done by the Leave campaign who were able to focus uh, most of their resources, almost all their resources, in fact, on a relatively small number of people, about seven million people, hoping to get several hundred thousand people to shift. And they did this in the last 10 days of the campaign, and they were very successful. You will know if you have uh, cephalogical interests that uh, the turnout on a polling day in a general election or a referendum will drop by a perfectly predictable percentage if it rains uh, on that day. For some reason, there's a very, very uh, clearly identifiable group of people who do not like to get their feet wet on polling day. In London, on the um, fatal day, the 23rd of June 2016, the it rained all day. And in fact, it rained more and more and more as the day went by. The drop in the turnout was exactly predictable. And the drop in the turnout in London alone was larger than the margin by which leave won. So if you, if you are, are very clever about how you're going to use these tools to influence a system which is, which is vulnerable to influence because of the way it's constructed, because of the way the electorate has been uh, defined and so on, you know that you can manipulate a, a result. And this raises questions about the robustness of our democratic processes. And therefore, uh, uh, that is yet another reason to be looking at those processes and asking ourselves questions about them. Now, I'm conscious of the fact that, that we don't have a huge uh, amount of time, but I do really want, want to mention that in addition to the institutional questions, and I've only just skimmed the surface there, talking about the, the system of, uh, of um, representation and about the, the uh, separation of powers issue in the Westminster model and so on, there are a number of other uh, institutional questions that we need to uh, address. And th the very great importance of them is this. If you go back to the um, beginning of book two of Livy's History of Rome, you will see him say there that uh, the great importance of the expulsion of the Tarquins, the kings from Rome, was that what was put in place of rule by men was rule by law. Now that is a very, very profound uh, point because to, to uh, construct institutions uh, and uh, a legal framework which constrains and limits what uh, individual human beings can do when they, are, when they populate those institutions is a very important safeguard against bad government. If, you, if the purposes of government are, and this is a, a, another point that we could, we could explore and discuss, but if the purposes of government are um, to provide uh, uh, just laws and a stable framework uh, of life for people in a society and to act in the interests of everybody, all the minorities that make up uh, a society, because a society is always a confederation of different interests and generations and so on. If those are the purposes of government, you want to ensure that you constrain the individuals who pull the levers of government by having a, a, a proper constitutional and institutional framework to do it. And so if there are things wrong with the structure of the constitution, then th they need to be addressed. Uh, and that is a, a point that we can explore further. But I just want to say something about the, the people and practices, about the sort of people who, who go into politics and why they do. <coughs> there, are many, th th there are many points that one can, can raise here. For example, careerism in politics. If you happen to land a safe seat uh, uh, in Parliament, you can, you've got a job for life and you don't have to do a damn thing except turn up at your constituency surgery. Uh, you know, every Friday for a certain number of weeks in the year. 
Or you can get, you can get into, into Parliament and be very ambitious to become a minister or perhaps even the Prime Minister. And in order to do that, wh what do you have to do? Well, think of this. There are 650 MPs in the um, British House of Commons. Uh, there's one Prime Minister and there are a couple of dozen Cabinet Ministers. So to get anywhere near the top of the greasy pole, you've got to be reasonably firmly attached to the buttocks of the person just above you on the greasy pole in order to uh, uh, achieve that altitude. That means compromising any principles that you might have had at the outset. It means obeying the party line. It means obeying the whips, uh, not jeopardizing your career. Remember, if you uh, rebel against the, the whips in the House of Commons, you are in danger of losing your job. You might be you might lose the whip and therefore they're not going to support you at the next election. Um, they might, it might spoil your chances of a, a ministerial career. And so uh, individual MPs are very leery about um, annoying the whips. In any case, of course, the whips find out everything they can about you um, and then threaten you with exposure in the Daily Mail if you don't behave and so on. So this is very, very um, a normal practice. I don't know whether you know this, but the uh, Palace of Westminster lies outside the common law of England. So practices uh, that are outlawed in any workplace other than the Palace of Westminster are permissible in the Palace of Westminster and they are used. So the, the net effect of careerism and party discipline, and again those of you who are historians here of our fair land will know that um, as the franchise increased uh, during the course of the 19th century, um, party uh, organisation increased, the importance of party discipline became paramount, uh, and now the, the whipping system, the party discipline system, and the idea of a career in politics has the, the following net effect, that members of parliament tend to represent uh, the interests of their party line uh, as often, and sometimes perhaps more often, than the interests of their country or their constituency. And that is a direct effect of the way the politics is organised. If people were only allowed to stand for parliament once, for one term, that would instantly put an end to careerism. You might say, well then, what about people of great gifts who could become great statesmen or great stateswomen and who would uh, you know, give the kind of leadership that we've only very rarely seen? <coughs> well, I agree that that, that that is a point, but it reminds me of a story told by a uh, Han Fei. Uh, those of you who are, uh, can read ancient Chinese may remember the story in Han Fei Zhe of the of the farmer who was ploughing in his field, in the middle of which uh, stood a tree. And as he was ploughing, he saw a hare racing across the field, and it smashed into the tree and broke its neck and died. And so he cooked it and ate it, and it was so delicious that he put his plough to one side and sat by the tree and waited for the next hare. Well, the point of the story that Han Fei tells is that to wait for the great statesman to come along in the hope that it doesn't matter about the constitution or the political process, but some great leader will eventually uh, emerge, is, uh, you know, that's, that's bad, bad strategy. Now what you have to do is make sure the institutions will deliver good government and not hope that another hare will come racing along. So this idea that uh, uh, w we should do something about the, the party whipping system, I mean, here's another simple example. You will know from your bemused uh, observance of what's been happening in Parliament over recent weeks uh, that our system, our parliamentary system, is very archaic and very laborious. And the forms of uh, uh, the, uh, the practices in Parliament are such that whoever constitutes the executive of the day has an absolute stranglehold on process. And it's incredibly difficult for, for Parliament, even a majority in Parliament, to uh, get in the way of a, of a determined executive if, if it wants to get its way. Just think of this one simple solution. E electronic voting. You press a button if you're going to say yes or, or no. Well, you've got two buttons, so you've got a yes button and a no button. And you press whichever one you, you happen to be uh, in favour of at the moment. And supposing the voting is anonymous, so the whips can't pick up on you for, for rebelling. In other words, uh, MPs will be voting their judgment uh, much more than they would be voting their uh, career interests. That could transform the face of, uh, uh, of, of politics. I mean, there, there are all sorts of, there's in fact a whole pixelation of, of uh, things that one could think of that would modernise and bring up to date and make more flexible and responsive um, the, the, the system so that the people who populate the system will behave better or we, that we will get better out of them. At the moment, um, we, we don't. We have an archaic system which uh, traps people into doing things and we know that the majority 
of members of parliament are Remainers. And yet, w w we've seen uh, two, nearly three years now of mayhem as a result of the fact that they want to keep party cohesion because that's you know, much more important than anything else. They want to look after their careers, they, 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 the um, unthinkable uh, idea of a new alliance across party, even a temporary one to try to rescue the country from the difficulty, even that seems uh, almost impossible to achieve. And so thinking about the, the people side and the way that they, they conduct themselves is also an important point of reform. So I will end on this point now, and I know that I'm gabbling on, I'm sorry. We have an uncodified constitution in this country. Some people misdescribe it as an unwritten constitution. It's not exactly correct, because some parts of our constitutional order are, in fact, uh, written down in the form of statutes and so on. But we also have a set of uh, precedents and practices and traditions which have been very well described as a set of understandings that nobody understands. And that, of course, has been precisely uh, of great utility to um, uh, successive executives who can pretty well do what they like and make things up as they go along, as we see from the referendums that we've held in this country since the 1970s. I mean, some of them have had thresholds and some not, and some have included 16 euros and some not, and so on. So the, the very fact that there is inconsistency and that they're very patchy in, in their uh, nature and application should be a, a big red flag about how we are conducting ourselves here. So the question of codifying the Constitution is a very, very complex one. More than 10 years ago, du during the time that Gordon Brown was uh, Prime Minister, uh, he invited a, a group of people, of whom I was one, to go to Downing Street to discuss the possibility of, of a, a written Constitution. That was the phraseology used. And at that meeting, the, the very first thing that happened at that meeting was that a question was, was put to the special advisers who were uh, there, Mr. Brown's advisers. And the question was this, do you want to try to write down our constitution? And uh, no, try, try to, to set out exactly what all the uh, aspects of it are. That would be a very complex matter. It would throw up the need for a lot of primary legislation to regularize our, our activities as a, as a state. Um, but it would be politically uncontentious. Nobody's going to mind if we did the scholarly job of, of just trying to note things down. We would find ourselves uh, faced with the following difficulty. But the House of Commons is elected by a plurality system, the first-past-the-post system, which, as you know, is disastrous. It's what elects the House of Representatives in the United States of America. If you need persuading, by the way, here's the example. Constituency of 100 voters. Ten people stand, eight get, eight, vote, uh, eight get ten votes each, one gets nine, one gets eleven. The person who gets eleven votes goes to Parliament. Eighty-nine people out of the hundred are unrepresented completely. A vote for a losing candidate in the first-past-the-post system is a, 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 a nugatory vote. It, it's worth nothing. And this happens uh, um, here and in the US and in Canada and in, and in India and a number of other places. And it's deeply unrepresentative. In the case of the United States, is made worse by the fact that the states there uh, define the congressional districts, that's the constituencies, and they are so gerrymandered in most of the states of the United States of America that some fantastic percentage, I've read over 90% of um, uh, seats in the House of Representatives never change hands from one party to another as a result of this. So th th that system is, is, is very, very uh, unrepresentative. So, in this country, we have a plurality for the uh, system for the House of Commons, and we have almost every single other kind of proportional voting system for almost everything else that we do, for European elections, for um, uh, uh, devolved uh, assembly elections, um, for mayors. Uh, even in the House of Commons itself, they use proportional representation systems of voting to vote for chairs of select committees and so on. So it's not as though they haven't heard of it before or that they're not used to it. They do it, but they stick to the original um, first-past-the-post system for this very good reason, that it guarantees a two-party system and uh, it excludes third parties. And people say that even though it is very unrepresentative, it gives artificial majorities to one party or the other, and therefore you get, and I quote, strong government, which we have been witnessing in recent times, strong government, and that um, uh, uh, coalition governments, which are produced by proportional representation systems, are undesirable. Every, almost every single uh, successful 
state and economy in the world uh, and is, has governments elected by proportional representation and they have coalition governments. There are one or two states, Italy and Israel stand out, which have uh, PR systems that produce um, very unstable government because very small groups in, in the legislature can influence the, the government. But you know, it's not beyond the wit of human beings to devise a PR system that deals with that problem. And indeed, uh, uh, you know, at SA at POSI, we see plenty of examples of such cases. Um, Germany, for example, has a, a, has a system which produces um, a very stable government and, and a successful economy. So, so we can see that, 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 that there are uh, great advantages to be had in codifying at least part of the Constitution. That part of it which deals with how our um, uh, government order is arranged. Uh, and any Constitution, and one of the reasons why in this country there's been such a reluctance to have a codified Constitution, any Constitution has the, uh, uh, the primary purpose of defining and thereby limiting the powers of the executive and of the legislature of, of government. And that, as we see, uh, from the misuse to which our uh, Westminster model uh, constitutions have been put in, in recent years and their vulnerability to the kind of manipulation we talked about with the weaponizing of the, the usual political propaganda and, and, and so on, we need greater protections against it and codification would uh, provide that. Now, I've, I've skated extremely fast over a lot of different topics and I'm sure you and others will want to pick me up on some of them. But thank you very much. Thank you so much for the speech, Professor. So if I may, to keep it brief, I want to focus on one concept that you raised in that, and that's the concept of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. So on the Brexit referendum in particular, so the Brexit referendum had the highest number of votes cast since the 1992 general election, which elected John Mayer and the Conservative government. And more people voted to leave the, leave the European Union than have ever voted for any government or indeed any previous referendum. But taking your statement that the 17.4 million votes for leave weren't enough for the action to be legitimate because of how it was based on a restrictive franchise akin to a general election electorate, is the logical corollary of that assertion that no UK government itself could ever be legitimate? Well, I mean, it's, an, it's a rather an interesting question in a way because uh, UK governments have uh, historically been um, elected on minorities of, the, uh, of electorate, certainly, uh, and even in some cases of the popular vote, of the, of the actual vote cast on the day. Uh, and um, th this is a feature of, of our system which raises very serious question marks. It raises a, 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 a question which lies alongside the, the point about numbers. And that is whether we think a democracy is a, a, a system in which um, the processes involved give the consent of the people to government, which is a phrase used by Jefferson in his writing of the American Constitution, or whether the people are actually licensing and entitling another group of people to go and do a job of work on their behalf. And these are two very, very different concepts. And it's the first concept which has been re relied upon in our very undemocratic system, where a government uh, based, which has a, a substantial majority of the seats in the House of Commons on about 40% of the, of the vote, uh, and perhaps a smaller percentage of the total electorate, nevertheless can regard itself as having the consent of the people because people don't rise in rebellion against them. But if you wanted to argue that a democracy should be such that the, the, the actual will, the choices, the preferences of the people, the voices of the people have been heard and are reflected in the legislature and in the executive, then our system has, has always been, from that point of view, at any rate, highly questionable. Then the consequence of that in relation to the Brexit vote is that Again, you said that the justification was that the people voted to leave, but it was only 37% that did so, and that's a betrayal of the people to follow the 37%. But wouldn't it be an even bigger betrayal of the people to ignore the 37% and follow the decision of the 34% that voted? No, I don't think so, because the, the, the point is not about uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the um, relative percentage of the two groups of people who went out to vote. The, the, the point is whether or not regarding a vote of uh, a little over a third of the total electorate is sufficient to trigger a major constitutional change. Now, the, the interesting point is this. 
I pointed out right at the outset that all referendums are advisory, constitutionally speaking. Politically speaking, they may be um, denominated as, as mandating, and indeed David Cameron said, <coughs> we're going to, we're going to you know, follow the outcome of the referendum. So what was the outcome of the referendum? Was it that it wasn't that 51.9% of the people had chosen to leave the EU, because the 37% of the electorate represent 26% of the people. So if you were a responsible government and you're thinking to yourself, right, in constitutionally, this is an, an, a, an advisory referendum, we've had the advice of 26% of the total population to do X, shall we do it? Shall we, uh, on the basis of the plans, programs, roadmaps, costings, impact studies, and so on, that weren't done before the referendum, shall we leave the EU? That is the question. So then, taking that, and in the context of your assertion that Parliament is sovereign and no other body in the state is sovereign, and that you accuse the government of acting in an illegitimately political way by following the advisory referendum, in the 2017 SNAP general election, the Conservative manifesto explicitly pledged to negotiate Brexit and then leave. The Labour manifesto explicitly said that it would accept the results of the referendum and leave with certain conditions and protections being met. The SNP manifesto said that it would proceed with the Brexit negotiations and then have a Scottish independence referendum. The Liberal Democrats even themselves said that they would have a final referendum after negotiations. And the DUP, of course, supported Brexit in its entire form. So why is it that would it be illegitimate for the Parliament, which is the only sovereign body, to keep its manifesto commitments across the five parties and still leave the European Union? Well, uh, the counter-argument to that would be to say that each of the parties might reflect on the fact that none of them uh, achieved the majority, and that that looks as though there was no, there was no uh, uniform preference uh, in the country for uh, any of the, the forms, not, not, not that any of them had been explicated at that point for what, what Brexit might actually mean. I mean, what, what's very interesting is that the two main parties, so the Conservatives and, and the Labour Party, um, had uh, um, uh, both of them lost the election. And it was only because the, uh, the, 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 the sitting government was able to persuade a, a minor party to give it a comfort and supply arrangement that it is still in government now. That also, by the way, raises very serious questions because if, if a, a government goes to the country and loses its majority, even on our rather ramshackle electoral system at the moment, um, what, what legitimacy does it have or can it claim? The, the only legitimacy it, it, it can claim is the one that it gets from uh, get getting a partner by, in effect, um, uh, uh, entering into coalition. The fact that we've had, in effect, coalition governments for most of the last nine years in this country is by itself a symptom of the fact that the, the people of the country, the people who are enfranchised and who vote, are, are no longer satisfied with giving the consent to a minority government in the country. But isn't it still the case that if the majority of people voted for a party which actively supported leaving the European Union, how could it possibly be more legitimate to remain following that general election? Well, it's because uh, you wouldn't wish, I think, to argue that um, a, a policy which was mooted by a government, uh, by a political party in an election, let us say 10 years or 50 years or 100 years ago, should uh, be, be because it received uh, um, uh, s uh, some support uh, in the electorate should still apply now. And then that argument would m make us say that when the 1975 referendum was held on European membership, uh, which had a 67% majority in favour of doing so, uh, and that was uh, uh, greater than the 40% threshold, not that it had um, put in place a threshold, that that should still be binding now. You know, the, the, the point is that in a democracy, we are always uh, are up for and invited to and encouraged indeed to contest and to argue and to um, try to change things. So um, I mentioned at the outset this business about all the Remain organisations in the, in the UK which have done consistently done polling and focus groups and the findings uh, of that are very much aligned with the, the public ones like YouGov and the others which have shown that the majority in favour of uh, EU membership, which only very, very temporarily switched to a majority for leave just in the days before the 2016 referendum, and presumably uh, something to do with the success of the campaign, and then switched back to a, a Remain majority, that that Remain majority has grown and grown. So if one were to be, if, if one were to be very thoughtful about this, one would say, look, let us be sure that the 
decision um, that the electorate uh, uh, made on the 23rd of June 2016 is uh, stable and stands. It's a bit like the kind of situation you would want if we had uh, legal physician-assisted suicide here and you wanted to check that a person who asked for euthanasia, whether they still think that that's the right cause. So how would you check that? If you don't think we should have another referendum to check that and you don't think that if we had another general election and all the parties supported it, that would be legitimate? No, I do think we should have, sorry to interrupt you, but I do think we should have another referendum. I'm no friend to referendums for for the reason that I uh, pointed out that in a representative democracy, (coughs) really our our representatives should be doing the job of work that that we require of them. I, I, let me just make one little footnote remark before I come back to this, but don't let me get away from the second referendum point, wh- which is that if there is one thing, and I, I think the European Union has many flaws and faults and it needs reform and so on, but I'm a great admirer of its ideal, which is for peace and progress and for unity and cooperation and so on. So I'm, a, I, I'm very, very much in, in favour of that. But if I had one complaint about it, it is that because of the collective activity of the European Union as a whole on matters of, uh, um, of economic uh, policy and trade, uh, what one result has been that the political debates in member states have changed character over, over time. So if you were to go back before 1970, before 1970 in this country, there were tremendous ideological battles between right and left over the direction of the country and the, how the economy ought to be run and so on. And socialist arguments about the commanding heights uh, then persuaded more people than they do now. And so you, you have these great divisions. The result of membership of the EU has been that those great ideological battles no longer take place. And one consequence of that is that the proportion of people who go into politics, since politics has been a less exciting and a a less influential thing, who who are not actually first rate, has risen. Um, And uh, uh, if you were to read uh, uh, Simon Jenkins' column in The Guardian today, or yesterday, I forget where it was, where he talks about the very impoverished quality of of, uh, uh, MPs, uh, well, I think there's a certain justice to that, and that might be a symptom of uh, how things have changed. So... So that does raise the question about our representatives having the responsibility and the duty to do the work, do the due diligence, get uh, um, uh, you know, a really good, rich, well-informed discussion going, and on that basis, thinking what is really in the interests of everybody and of the country and its future. That's how it should be. But successive parliaments have, have uh, uh, sloughed off that responsibility by having referendums, which are crude, very crude instruments, especially for dealing with things of this complexity. But now that we're in that game, and now that we're in a situation where the country is so deeply and bitterly divided, and, and we've seen the, the wreckage of our governmental and political order over the last two and a half years, I mean, it's a, an embarrassing situation that we're in in this country, the only solution is to go back and, and, and say, now, now you know much more. Now you've had a lot more information. Now you've heard a great deal more argument. Many more facts and claims and false facts and so on have come out. Now you've had a, a, a tra- time to think about this. What do you, what do you think? Are you, do you want to go on with this or, or do you want to stop? And I think that now that is the only uh, way forward. Do you think that referendum should have the same goalposts and markers as the 2016 referendum? Or should it be with a supermajority, with an enfranchised electorate? Do you think... It the conditions should be separate? Well, there is a a debate to be had about whether we go just to exactly to the same people as before, or or whether we acknowledge the fact that there are vitally interested groups of people who are going to be really affected by by the outcome and give them a voice. You know, one one really significant uh, point that any democracy that wishes to be thought of as a democracy must take seriously is this. A vote is a voice. And and if you have a vote, you have an entitlement to your voice to be heard. In a plurality system like ours, all the losing votes are silent. Uh, They have been disenfranchised by by the system. And uh, it's terribly important that the the overall preferences, and there will be great diversity, and there's a lot of competing interests and desires and needs in society, uh, levels of of, uh, grasp of the implications of using your vote one way rather than another. But... Th- th- there should be some kind of permutation, some, s- s- some over the totality that tells us something about what the, the national preference is, the national sentiment is, in a way that genuinely reflects it. The first-past-the-post system doesn't do that.
So I would have uh, long been a way of saying, yes, I, I would myself think that, that people who are going to be affected by the outcome should have a say. So then the final question I've got before we open up to the floor is that if you then change the goalposts before having the second referendum, what do you think the consequences are for civil society and the trust in democracy for those 17.4 million people who voted to leave, who now think that the system is being changed to reverse their decision and see the vote that way? That, that, that is a good point, and, and it suggests that uh, um, it, it might in this case be uh, that you do one of the following two things. The less complicated one is you have the same, you have the same um, electorate. Uh, the other is that you distinguish between the same electorate and the people who were denied a voice the last time round. That if there was some way of differentiating these two groups of people, and then you could see whether you get a, an overall majority from when you uh, sum both, or whether there are majorities in both groups. Uh, but you know that could raise the difficulty that you have a majority for um, X in one and Y in the other, and then you've got to work that out. But uh, you know they, 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 there are imaginative ways that you could deal with the problem, and we certainly need them now. But just, just to get a, a specific, what do you think the consequences would be? Do you think those people would become more disenfranchised from the political system? Do you think they then have more faith in it with the second referendum? Look, I, I think that, that w w whatever happens, there is going to be a, a lot of annoyance and, and anger. There's a huge amount of anger um, among um, the now majority in the country, which uh, is for Remain, who feel that they have being stolen away from the EU by a, a relatively small group of people who for decades have been working very hard, like woodworm, to undermine the system. Uh, and, and you get this, this um, you know, sort of extraordinary phenomenon of a, a, a bunch of, of um, toffs, as some critics call them, you know, the, 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 the mogs of this world, who have very successfully uh, harnessed the um, support of uh, you know, people who work in factories uh, to, to get a result that suits them. So, you know, all the sceptics who think this is really about EU tax regulations and the like. Um, there, so the, 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 there will, there's anger on both sides. The, it, we're a very divided society now because of this, and that's not going to go away. It's not, certainly not going to go away if we just go ahead with Brexit. Um, and in any case, uh, my, my own feeling is, and I've just published an article this week on this very point, that uh, it's still possible that Brexit will be stopped. So there are mechanisms uh, by, by which that may happen. And uh, in fact, as day follows day, so the likelihood that it will be increases. But it's also the case that uh, if some form of Brexit happens, it's almost certain to be a relatively soft form of Brexit. No deal bre kind of Brexit is, is uh, the by far the least likely outcome. If there's no majority for it in, in Parliament. If there's some form of soft Brexit, then the following will be the case. We sit right next to the world's biggest and most successful trading bloc, and we're going to have to trade with it. And to trade with it, we have to observe its standards and its regulations and its requirements. And to do so without any voice, without any vote, without any influence, and without any veto over some of the things that it might do, seems to be an act of madness. And so with the demographic change in our country and with the, the fact that the Paradoxically, the whole Brexit mess has galvanized millions of people in this country who realize what the value of the EU is and that they want to be part of it. It hadn't been much of a subject of conversation beforehand, but it's certainly become one now. And it's astonishing the number of people who, having learned more about the EU, are now more enthusiastic for it. And so my confident prediction is, and I hope I'm around for you to, to, to call me out on it, if I, in you know, five or ten years' time, if, we were, if some form of Brexit were to happen, that it wouldn't last very long. Well, on that point, let's open up the questions to the floor. If you put your hand and wait for the microphone to be given to you. Uh, yeah, let's go to the gentleman. Um, thank you very much for your remarks. My name is Joel. I'm studying the BCL at Jesus College. Uh, my question is regards to um, the courts and the system of separation of powers, particularly some arguments that have been raised that the Supreme Court should be representative of the community or the nation, uh, more particularly Justice Antonin Scalia, as he then was remarked that um, to have a group of very elite people decide on a matter, or a socially contentious matter on behalf of a very diverse population would, be, would not be right and morally correct. What is your take on that idea that the courts must also be representative? And then, do you think that's achievable? Do you think um, the appointment of judges should then change 
to be based on other criterion that can mm. make them more representative. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, um, it's a very, very, uh, very interesting question and, and a very difficult uh, problem, actually. As you know, in some states of the United States of America, judges at certain levels uh, are uh, elected. Um, uh, and they're elected, of course, on sort of party political lines, uh, often enough for the uh, separation of powers problem to very much raise its ugly head in that connection. The, uh, the idea that the, the um, administration of justice should be predicated on, on a system where you don't have a particular, a very, very particular group of people making decisions on behalf of that great diversity, that, that, that point is, is an extremely compelling and powerful one. But so is the point that what you need in a, in a, a system of justice is <coughs> people of intellectual quality and of, and of expertise who, um, who at the same time one could rely upon to really adhere to, to cleave to the idea that justice must be um, done in a way that is maximally fair and independent of the kinds of pressures that come out of class and race and, and so on, consciousness. So it's, it's very hard to, to pick which way to go. There are certain judicial systems in the world, and my own view is that uh, you know, even though one could criticize the, the old white men, Oxford, Cambridge uh, background of the senior judiciary in, in this country, and, and you know, one can indeed criticize it on that grounds. But there are judiciaries like our own, I think, which come very close to uh, fulfilling what one would really like to see from a judiciary very reflective, uh, uh, very, very, um, uh, know, very um, powerful in, in the um, kind of thinking that they bring to, to the task that they're performing. Whether that's the case in, in the United States of America, well, um, if you read the history of the Supreme Court, you see that there have been some very remarkable individuals there into whose hands you would quite comfortably place you know, decisions about your own life. I think uh, uh, there are some very remarkable characters but also some very questionable ones as well. The questionable ones may um, themselves, of course, be the product of the fact that there's too much political influence in the choosing of them, that if you had even less, and therefore even greater remoteness from the diversity of the society as a whole, uh, you, you, might get, um, you might get better judging. But you're quite right, it's a very difficult point. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's something very desirable about government reflecting diversity. I've just been making the point in favor of you know, preferences <coughs> being reflected in the way that government is constituted through proportional representation. But could it be that the judiciary is very, very much more like your, your um, surgeon in hospital, that, uh, that you pick your surgeon as you pick your judge because of their ability and their background? I know you will say, they only have that ability and background because they come from a certain class, and that does ir iterate the difficulty. So the, the, the answer is um, this. <laughs> In other words, it's a difficult problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, to the hand on the front row, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, my name is Peter Burke, I'm chair of Oxford for Europe, and I mention that in this audience because we are, I think, um, very largely people who are ideologically in support of the organization, and I hope that people will Google us and join us. Um, on, after that uh, brief plug, can I say well done to end a, a super talk with a positive note. You talked about the galvanization of opinion in this country and the fact that, uh, as it happens, uh, the UK now has, I believe, the largest uh, pro-European movement of any country in Europe. Mm. Um, so, uh, the other point I was going to make to you, uh, my, my, my namesake, Edmund Burke, keeps being trotted out by politicians of both sides, mm -hmm. and the distinction between um, being a, a representative and being a delegate. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it seems to me, and I, I think what you've said very much underlines it, that as a public represent representative, uh, the fact that something is popular is not good enough to justify supporting it. Mm -hmm. So MPs and representatives have got to stand over to see decisions that they make. Mm -hmm. And if they make wrong decisions, then they should be liable for them, mm -hmm. personally as well as as a party. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, for example, in the slave state, somebody, as a result of a referendum or a public vote, decided that um, slavery was right, mm -hmm. that doesn't make it right. Mm -hmm. And equally, we can say, if uh, Brexit is bad for the country, it's damaging, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that it's popular doesn't make it right. I'd be interested mm -hmm. in your views about that. 
Well, I mean, we have the, the uh, um, a example of uh, uh, popular majorities in favour of capital punishment in this country for a very, very long time. I don't know how things stand on it now because it hasn't been yeah, polled. 52 percent. Still? Oh, sorry, 51.9 percent is almost the, the same group of people as voted for Brexit. Oh, <laughs> dear, oh dear. Okay. <laughs> so, so there's still a majority in favour of it, but uh, we're Parliament is extremely unlikely ever to, to act on it and, and to say that's the will of the people, so we must start hanging people from lampposts and so on. So that um, is a, a very good example of how uh, the, the Burkean principle uh, operates with at least some things. What you notice is that um, w the Burkean principle tends to be observed when it aligns with the convenience of a political party or what Parliament sentiment happens to be at, at a given time. And that should not be the case. It should be the case that in, 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 um, in that distinction I drew earlier between just passively giving consent, and so even indeed consenting to minority governments as we always have done in this country, to a much more active <coughs> attitude that we are, we are sending people to do a job of work, licensing them and asking them, requiring of them that they do a job of work on our behalf. M m much as we do through our taxes, uh, 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 educate people to become surgeons and so on, we want them to acquire and to exercise a certain expertise. And if they don't do it, we recall them, that is by not voting for them next time round. This is a much more active and positive view of what we expect of our, of our representatives. And in order to protect that function from being suborned by party discipline and the whipping system and careerism in politics, we need to be able to protect individual members of the legislature so that they can exercise their judgment uh, on the basis of those facts and those discussions. And I, I gave two very simple examples, you know, update, modernize uh, the way we do things, have an electronic voting system which is anonymous, uh, or um, uh, get rid of the uh, party discipline system by saying that uh, a, a member of parliament is as protected as any employee is anywhere in the country from being uh, uh, over manipulated or blackmailed or bullied by uh, his or her employees. That kind of thing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, bless. Jump to the hand, just there. Thank you for your fascinating talk, Professor Groening. Uh, my name is also Edmund, and I study history at New College. After the 29th of March, Brexit will be the status quo, just as Remain was on the 23rd of June 2016. Its overturning would then surely have to be considered as radical the constitutional change as Article 50 was. Would this require a supermajority? I'm wondering if you think there is a tension between advocating that the public be permitted to reconsider all political matters should they wish, such as via a second referendum, and a set of constitutional reforms, I, I think you advocate, such as the supermajority requirement, that would in fact create a great deal of constitutional inertia against radical political change. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not quite sure I got, got uh, every element of, of a quite complex question, but um, a part, a part because the acoustic was such that I, I didn't catch every word, sorry. Um, the, um, w one thing to notice is that the, the having of periodic general elections is a pre precisely the recognition of the fact that people can change their minds and that people don't like the way things are, are going. They've made a choice, they voted one way, they may not like how it's going, so they vote another way later on. Um, <coughs> of course, the, um, uh, we, we all know, familiar with the point that people tend to vote uh, just for labels, party labels. The very, very big problem with the way that general elections are run in a plurality system and a two-party system is that you either have to buy the whole agenda, you know, the whole uh, um, uh, manifesto, and you can't be selective about, about, about parts of it, uh, so th that, that, that's, that adds another layer of disconnect between the preferences of voters and, and what actually happens once a government is formed. But th that principle, the principle that we can change uh, our minds is a very important one. In systems like, for example, the Swiss system where they have uh, got quite a lot of referendums, with relatively low turnouts and relatively conservative results as a result of, of, of that, uh, the idea that, that you could, um, it's not just a question of sort of directly influencing the course of policy, but, but that you could con continually, as it were, take the temperature of the society and see how, how people are feeling, has a great deal to recommend itself in, in one way. But um, if you went to the extreme, if all of us voted on issues of the day electronically every morning on our television sets, we see a proposition, we press our yes button or our no button, 
uh, we would get very disorganized and chaotic government and we would get people really dropping out and turning off f from, the, from the system Wh when we need precisely uh, what, what, what you were hinting at there, the idea of more engagement, more interest and more activism in the society. So I think that if, if we had, um, uh, if we had uh, a system of representation where every time we went to the ballot box we felt we were making a real difference to the outcome, I, I think that would deal with a great deal of the, of the uh, um, sort of lassitude, politically speaking, that there is in the society, because people say with a great deal of truth that their vote is not going to make a difference. So I think we've got time for one final question, and let's go, yeah, to the hand. Uh, just behind you, sir, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Cheryl. I've been studying the MPP at the Blavani School of Government. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is about the second referendum. So I, as a global citizen, I'm disappointed in the referendum result in 2016. Um, but we cannot deny that um, the elitism in Westminster has given rise to um, populists like Boris Johnson to capitalize on. So if there is a second referendum, and if that overturns the first decision, with that, in the optics of the public, they were seen as these elite are gaming the system once again to get their way. And wouldn't that create the perfect environment for extreme populists to take over this country? Well, two interesting points there. Well, well, one is I think that the case for a second referendum rests in very large part on the fact that it would be a much, much more informed one. Uh, you know, n n now that people have had an opportunity to hear a great deal more about the pluses and minuses, the benefits and disbenefits, uh, what would happen um, if we leave uh, the European Union, um, wh what, what uh, analyses we've uh, had since then about the impact on the economy. I mean, we see a report in the press today that one in three companies in the United Kingdom are making plans to move their operations to Europe if uh, Brexit were to happen. Um, we, we, we can see the consequences now in a way that weren't visible beforehand mainly, largely indeed, because nobody imagined that there would be a leave outcome of that referendum. And the, the, the interesting point about the, the populism issue and the, the fear that there might be a, a, an upsurge of populism has to be uh, thought about in the following context. Those people who voted to remain in the EU in 2016 were largely voting for the same reason as everybody else who voted to remain, on the basis of 40 years of knowledge of EU membership. The people who voted to, to leave were a very diverse set of, of groups of people. There were those who um, were worried about immigration. There were those who wanted to give a kicking to the establishment of the government, to Cameron, uh, because he was campaigning for uh, Remain. They wanted to be on the other side of the argument because they feel that austerity policies in this country had harmed their communities and themselves, as indeed they have done. And then there were people who um, had I don't know, uh, you know, dreams of, of empire and former greatness of the country and nostalgia and the sense that, uh, 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 you know, we, we, we were no longer free to be that kind of thing. And then, of course, there would be people who had been influenced by uh, a perpetual drip, drip, drip of anti-EU um, stories about bendy bananas and all the rest of it from the tabloid press and from the sort of Eurosceptic wings of both far right and far left in this country. I have to remember that the far left are also uh, in favour of Brexit for the sorts of reasons that people like Tony Benn and Peter Shaw put forward in the referendum campaign of the 1970s, as some of us remember. So w w when we worry about populism, when we think about a great popular uprising, you, what, what, what you would need for that is some unified feeling uh, that, that um, brought them all together and wanted to make them active. And um, on the basis of what I've just said, the, the unified feeling would only be about Whatever my reason was for voting leave, that, that has been overturned. So they would have to make common cause on that, even if their motivations had been very different. So that would be point number one. Point number two is, I, I mentioned in answer to an earlier question, that the 37% of the electorate represents about 26% of the population. And um, uh, Peter Kellner, of, uh, who used to head YouGov, pointed out that on the 19th of January this year, so just uh, a couple of weeks ago, even if nothing else had changed and nobody had changed their minds and no new information had come out, um, the, the, the demographic change, that is the uh, 
uh, 2 million people, just over 2 million people who've turned 18 since 2016, and the 1.8 million people who have died since uh, 2016. That demographic change by itself uh, produces a, a majority for Remain if the same referendum were held on the same constituency as in June 2016. So just demographics by itself, let alone any arguments. So a second referendum would, would have to be based on the idea that we are now, now going to, to test public opinion again on the basis that so much more information uh, is available and people have heard so much more argument on both sides of the question. This will be an informed referendum in a way that the first one was most emphatically not. And that I think should, but you see, the other point I want to make, sorry to bang on, <laughs> but, but um, populism, uh, the, the concept of populism is, is an interesting one in a way. It makes people think that the grassroots rises up and, you know, like the French Revolution or something. The French Revolution was revolutionary activity by Parisians uh, who do this on a fairly regular basis. This is the kind of Parisian thing. You know, if you look at history, it's every so many years they do it and they've just been doing it again. So it's a Parisian thing. So um, it, it's, not, it's not the people rising up. It's a, a, a group of, of people, a group of people who are geographically and socially and economically sufficiently unified temporarily for that to happen. Look at the Arab Spring, look at what happened in, in Egypt, and, and you see repeated there a, a tragic lesson that uh, uprisings teach, which is that those who initiate them don't inherit them. That in the case of, uh, for example, uh, Egypt, the, the Tahrir Square activity, young intellectuals, young middle class uh, educated people wanting democratic reform in Egypt, well, look what happened. They started a revolution, they toppled Mubarak, and then who stepped in but somebody worse? Uh, and, and what they aspired to and hoped for didn't happen. And that's very, very typical of those sorts of events. But populism, I I if you think about people, the, the, the people at the grassroots who have been marginalized and left behind, who, who feel that they've been ill-treated by society, if you're poor and unemployed and struggling and, and uh, um, you know, not very well connected with other people in other towns and cities who are feeling the same way, how are you going to organize and get together? Populism doesn't happen from the grassroots up. It happens because demagogues go to those people and say, I know what your problem is, it's the fault of, and then you point at something, the EU or the establishment or the government or something, I can solve your problem for you. They never do, but they say I can, and then they harness that power. Populism is actually, really, the, the temporary success of demagoguery in a society. Uh, if you, uh, so uh, an analysis of it and, uh, as, a, as a political, social uh, phenomenon is required to um, stop us being alarmed about the idea that there's going to be a, you know, the, the, the sort of myth of the French Revolution repeating itself. Well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. But if you could please join with me in thanking Professor Grayling for joining us today. <laughs> <laughs>